We started off this uh, service today by asking you a question. It's 17 words, and uh, it was spoken by our 35th president, and it said this. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Let's begin with a word of prayer, and I'd like to give you the last three of those things that you can do for your country. Father, I pray that you would bless this time in the Word of God. I ask, Lord, that you would help me to be effective and efficient. I do ask, Father, that the people would be hungry to get these last three points, and we would be eager to do what your Word says to do. Father, thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So we began with the first four things this morning. Number one, you can pray for your country's leadership so that we can worship in, pre- in peace. And that means as Christians without persecution and with a good conscience. Number two, you can pray for national regeneration from the top down, and that is salvation. Number three, you can testify about Jesus the Savior. You can be the salt and light that Jesus spoke about. Number four, you can make church great again. And so this afternoon, let's go to number five. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Romans 13. This passage is a a very well-used passage, especially on days like this, patriotic days, days that we remember our country. Would you stand, please? I'll read this first one to you as you're standing. Romans chapter 13, 1 through 7 says this. Let every soul, every person, be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The word power here means authority. But the powers that be are ordained of God. Ordained, interesting word. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Look up here a moment. This word damnation here just refers to destruction. It is not a promise of the lake of fire here. It just means that if you um, violate authority, if you break the laws of the land, you should expect destruction, not only from God, but from government itself who is ordained to destroy you. Look at verse 3. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then be afraid of the authority, of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the authority, or of the same. For he, government, is a minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. By the way, that's a little um, head nod or agreement with uh, capital punishment. Swords are not used to spank people. They're used to kill when necessary. For he is the minister of God, or avenger to execute wrath on him that doeth evil. Wherefore, ye must needs be subject, subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For, for for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render, therefore, unto all their dues, all their taxes, tribute to whom uh, tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, Honor to whom honor, the little play on words here. The Greek word honor is tame, which either can mean actually uh, money, to pay money, or it also can mean to pay respect. In this case, it obviously means both. You may be seated. What can you do for your country? Number five, you can honor government. You can honor government. The passage before us, as I said, is very well known, but is even more well ignored. Too many Christians would rather be Archie Bunker. You remember Archie Bunker? Yeah, you weren't allowed to watch that, I know, okay? I don't think I was allowed to watch it either, but he, Archie Bunker is just a funny guy. They're like Archie Bunker. They would rather complain and uh, bring up humongous things against government than actually do anything worthwhile uh, to help government. So many Christians are like this. They honor their country, um, unfortunately, by bringing complaint against it and not realizing that God has ordained government for his greater purposes. I posit the word ordained in the first, at least the first verse and other verses. It, it is an interesting word that actually means to arrange them or to assign them. God ordains government in a very particular way. 
And I think it's hard for us to understand, but in his greater picture, he allows people to gain office that maybe is, are directly against him, but for the greater purpose of disciplining the country or, or move to a position, you know, in God's great ways, he actually assigns or ordains government and people who, who are in government. It's a hard balance uh, for us to understand. It's a hard balance to know that God, the government is often corrupt and anti-God, yet to hear in this passage that we, and other passages I'll show you, that we are supposed to submit ourselves to government and not resist them. We are to subject ourselves with a good conscience. That means knowing the way, the attitude that I'm giving towards my government and obeying the laws of my land. I can do that with a clear, a clean conscience. We are to be, oh, willing to pay taxes. ay ay I knew a guy, I'm not going to say, I'm going to say his name, but my luck, he would actually watch this on video. I knew a guy named Dan, all right, who, when I was a teenager, um, we went somewhere with Dan, we were doing some mission trip or some work for the church, I can't remember what it was, me and a couple other guys, and he taught us in the pickup truck that Christians ought not pay their taxes, that, that government just uses it for too many bad things and that we should not pay our taxes and Christians shouldn't be ha- have to pay their taxes. And you know, there's whole groups of people that believe in this except for the Bible, except for what it obviously says. God ordained government. Uh, it is hard to know the balance, but it is our job, the Bible says, to honor government, honor. This morning we saw in, in a passage that we cannot murmur and complain against government, against society, and also shine as the lights uh, of Christ that we ought to. It, can't, it works against each other. When your neighbor, who you're trying to give the message of Jesus Christ, or your coworker, hears you just call whether whoever it is, Pe- President Trump, President Obama, whoever it is, if you, call, he, you, you say nasty things up one side and down the other about the administration, whatever, how can they hear the clear truth of Jesus Christ from someone who is supposed to be a spirit-filled believer? Okay, I'm just going to be straightforward with you. 1 Peter 2.17 says it this way, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. That's, some great, that's a great verse, very poetic. Okay? It ends with honor the king, which of course is a representative of the leader of your land. Jesus paid his taxes, and when questioned, said, Render unto Caesar the things which are Caesar, and unto God the things that are God, are God's. You know, he ordained You know, and that was certainly the present local government of the temple tax, but in the greater tax of Caesar. God established human government way back in Genesis and ordains it to keep law and order in the land. God does care about government. He established government. As we preach on in Genesis, we will see government established by the hand of God. As Christians, we must obey that law, every law of government. God ordains government to strictly punish offenders and when they 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 punish you when you have to answer to a summons when you have to go to court when you get that ticket when you you have to appear before that magistrate you have to understand they are standing there or sitting on that bench under God's authority to strictly punish offenders even to the death we saw with the sword they bear not the sword in vain he is God's minister to execute wrath on those that do evil and establish the law of the land I don't know how you were reared okay I was reared in West Virginia. I was raised in West Virginia where we absolutely knew what a yellow flag with a with a snake curled up in the middle meant. Some of you don't know what that means, all right? Don't tread on me. You know, uh, there's a lot of good old boys who their attitude is that that uh, I'll follow God and nobody else. I'm not going to follow the government, whatever, and and, uh, we're not under that and whatever. That's just that's unbiblical. You're not right if you're that lone ranger. The Lord has us to respect our government. Do you know what is interesting about this passage? I didn't notice any asterisks or footnotes when we read it. Honor your government when the Democrats are in office or when the Republicans are in office. Honor your government only, you know, if it's not a a communist government or it's not a dictatorship. No, there's no asterisks. You've got to understand the people of all the lands read this Bible. People today in Red China, in North Korea, they read this same scripture. It's hard, isn't it? 
No, we are never to obey government. If government establishes or establishes laws that are in direct disagreement with God, we obey God, the higher authority. But as a default attitude toward our president and our government and police and military, we are to honor, submit, subject ourselves, and obey them. Don't you dare let your children hear you, your grandchildren hear you. Call a police officer a pig. Or, or say something about our president, whichever president is sitting in office. It's not the right thing. 2 Peter 2.10 says, but chiefly, it's talking about bad people, it's talking about false teachers. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous they are, self-willed. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. That means of authorities, of authorities. Now look at this. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord and those that have authority. Angels won't even accuse or complain about them. It's an amazing verse. It is, it is the ungodly that despise government, not, not people who are you know, independent lone rangers. Angels don't even bring accusations of authorities before the Lord. Jude 1.9 gives a little commentary on what that verse is talking about. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, remember they were fighting over the body of Moses. I have no idea what that all means. When contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not or did not bring against him, against Satan, a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. He wouldn't even personally uh, rebuke Lucifer, in this matter, he deferred to the Lord's rebuke of him. And that is teaching us in 2 Peter 2, angels will not even complain and say bad things about an authority who is Satan. Principalities and power. And yet we so easily as Americans, we love our freedom of speech and we love to call government any nasty thing we want to. If angels respect authority, then we can certainly honor our government. Your voice is in your vote and your freedom of speech to present your views honorably towards authorities. I'm not always the best at that. You and I must do better at that. Don't imitate ugly, mudslinging politicians who say everything bad about their opponent. You don't need to get into that. As Christians, we don't help the cause of Christ when we push our American free speech to the nth degree to bash government and whatever administration is in the White House at the moment. How can we obey God and honor the king if we're bashing the king every four or eight years, respectively? By the way, the, the attitude of the American news media towards government officials is disrespectful. It's unacceptable no matter who the official is. It is not that. Some of you are old enough that you remember a time that no matter who was in the White House, there was respect towards the office. He was still, it didn't matter who he was and how poor a president he was, he was our president of these United States. He was the commander in chief. And nobody said, I'm going to move to Canada to get away from him. What can we do for our country as a Christian? You can honor government. And be thankful that you have a form of democracy where people have, a, have some say in the matter. And whether that you know, goes through the electoral college or, or not, we still have a say in this country. And I, I thought about this as I was preparing for the second service. Our worst president in our total history is better than many presidents, their best presidents in other countries that they've ever had. What can you do for your country? Number six, you can rear the next generation to fear the Lord. You can rear, I'm talking to a lot of parents, and I'm talking to a lot of grandparents, and some great-grandparents. All right, you can rear the next generation to fear the Lord. I think all pastors for the last 200 years have had the same fear. And that's fear, the fear is that their generation would be the last generation of Christianity. That's a real fear for pastors. For pastors, it certainly feels that each next generation loses more and more fear and faith towards Jesus Christ. But it is our responsibility, just like it was our parents' responsibility and their parents' responsibility, to bring children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord as Christian parents. We cannot shirk that responsibility. I preached hard and encouraged towards, um, 
towards the making the church great again, but it is not the youth pastor's responsibility to bring your children up in the er- nurture and admonition of the Lord. It's not Sunday school's responsibility. It's not junior church's responsibility. It's not K4T's responsibility. You are the first responsibility, and I would say among them, daddies, you are the one that was given. Fathers, bring your children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Do you remember the quote of God? We just, if you've been here on Sunday mornings, you you should be able to remember this. The quote of God, when he was, when God was walking away, you remember they had that meal with Abraham, and and, uh, the three strangers were walking away, the one being the Lord himself, and and he pauses, and the two go on, and he makes a decision that he's going to tell Abraham why he is going, or that he is going to destroy Sodom and the plain cities. And he says in the Bible why he told him. What tipped the scales of him divulging his plan? And the verse says this, For I know him, I know Abraham, that he will command his children and household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he had spoken of him. God brought Abraham into his confidence about the destruction of wicked people because he knew Abraham was not going to be like that, But he rather would be one who commanded his children and household to keep the ways of the Lord. And because of that character trait as a daddy in Abraham, God opened up what he personally was going to do to Sodom and the the plain cities. Wow. The word command. He will command his children, his household after him. That's not one that's often used from parents anymore, is it? Command towards their children. Modern parents don't command their children. Rather, they ask their children what they would like to do. They allow their children to make their own decisions and to make their own mistakes. That sounds all so free, doesn't it? I'm going to let my child make their own mistakes. Well, how's that working in America since we've tried that? How's that working since the days of Dr. Spock? Some of you don't even know who that is. You think it's associated with Star Trek. How's that working since we allow the children to make the decisions? Parents, I'm going to tell you a big secret, secret that may change your entire life. Here it comes. You can include grandparents in this. You are bigger than your children, and you can tell them what to do. Isn't that shocking? You can command them to do God's ways. It will not turn them away from God to command your children. It will not make them bitter and hate Jesus to make them go to church, to make them read their Bible, to make them follow the Lord while they're in your home. That's really a folklore fallacy. It's an incredible, I tip my hat to Satan. That's an amazing idea that he had to convince a whole society that if you force children to do the right thing, that they'll turn on you, or they'll turn on God. Just like you command them to take a bath, or to go to bed, or eat their vegetables, or brush their teeth, you can command them in the ways of God. Frankly, if children knew what was good for them, they really wouldn't need you, parents. It's, it's also very funny, and here's another fallacy, that there is a, an ongoing movement that goes to young people, it was, was millennials, but that time has passed, to find out what the wisdom of society is. They go to teenagers and early 20-somethings to ask what the best thing is. That's ludicrous. Scripture says, ask the wise elders what wisdom is. If your children, after you have reared them in the nurture and admission of the Lord, They decide, and many of them do, and it's not your fault, to choose to leave God's righteous way, choose to leave and turn their back on Jesus Christ and go into the world or whatever, then that's on them. But parents, please, and grandparents, please, while you have them now, bring them up and emerge, command them in the ways of God. Raise your children up in proper discipline, nurture and admonition of the Lord. Teach them who God is. Read your Bible Uh, talk about the Lord, teach them the gospel, teach them the Ten Commandments, teach them the Great Commandment and the Second Great Commandment, insist that they go to church and be involved in youth ministry, which is great for them, insist that they obey the Lord. 
Let me give you something to wake you up here on, in this afternoon. Do you know that Islam is on track right now to surpass Christianity as the world's largest religion by the end of this century? By the end of this century, there will be more Muslims in the world than Christians. And do you want to know, according to the Pew Research, the uh, excuse me, Pew Research, the organization that tracks these things, what is one of the cause? Large numbers of young people leave Christianity while that's not nearly the case with Muslims. It is so ingrained and indoctrinated Islam into these children, they don't leave unless by some sovereign work of God by grace to draw them to Christianity, to salvation. In fact, the average age of a Muslim in the world today is 24 years old. The average age of an evangelical Christian is 52 Folks, we are losing our children in Christianity, and I personally believe that one of the major cause is because of the relaxed, low priority we put on Christianity in the home and in the church and have allowed our children to make their own decisions in this thing. We expect the church to be a fun house to attract our children rather than a training ground to prepare our children to love the Lord. You can bless your country by being a parent or a grandparent that rears the next generation in the fear of the Lord. Finally, today, on this good patriotic Sunday, I bring you one more way you can help. One more way what you can do for your country. Number seven, you can hope in a better king and kingdom. You can hope in a better king and kingdom. I just want to make this point before we begin this week of celebration about our country. This world is not our home. We're just a passing through. Now, as I said in the first sermon, America is really not our Messiah. Hebrews eleven thirteen through 16 says it this way. These all died in faith. This is the great hall of faith. This is the comment about it. Having, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And that country is not red, white, and blue. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better country, that is a heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. In that great hall of faith in Genesis 11, we're told that those great heroes of faith embraced not earthly hopes and earthly promises and earthly kingdoms and earthly countries. They embraced spiritual hopes and spiritual dreams for God and spiritual allegiance to the Lord. They lived as strangers and pilgrims on the earth because they declared plainly that they sought a country earlier, earlier on in the passage whose builder and maker is God. They sought a better country, a heavenly country, because of that allegiance, God was not ashamed to be called their God. I love America with all my heart. I do. And I was thinking about that before coming. And I do have an optimism right now that I haven't had for a long time in America. I'm excited about what the next days are going to bring, what the next years are going to bring. I'm excited about the next uh, appointee for, for the um, Supreme Court, aren't you? For that opportunity, you know, presidents only get those opportunities every once in a while. I'm excited about that and where the direction is going to go. But, but my eyes, frankly, are on a better land. And you've got to keep that balance. God is preparing for us a city where all the injustice and pain will be banished. I love America with all my heart. So thankful to live in the land of the free and the home of the brave. I love cheeseburgers. I love apple pie. And I had a Chevrolet before it was demolished a couple weeks ago. I had to get that in there. But I'm not living for America, and neither should you. Our hope is not in democracy, political parties, red, white, and blue. Our hope and allegiance is to the next king and his kingdom. Amen? Yes? Amen. That's right. God's preparing for us a city where all injustice and pain will be banished, where sin will, will never be, where disappointments and failure will, will have no place, where anger and depression cannot lift their ugly heads where we are all one in Christ, where we'll see our Savior face to face, we'll sing His praises all our eternal days. And what a kingdom that will be. 
And the greatest thing that you can do on this last point for your country concerning the United States of America is to put people's eyes and your own eyes on the next king and the next kingdom. That's the, that's the greatest thing that could happen to America is to be looking at a different country. That country is our hope. That nation is our joy. But right now in this earthly land, what can you do for our country? Let's review and we'll be done. You can pray for our country's leadership. That was number one. That we may worship in peace. Number two, you can pray for national regeneration from the top down. That people will be born again. Number three, you can testify about Jesus the Savior. You can be the salt and light of the world. Number four, you can make the church great again. Number five, you can honor government. Number six, you can rear the next generation for the Lord, to fear the Lord. Number seven, you can hope in a better king, in a better kingdom. Amen? So this week, rejoice, be thankful, but don't forget the sermons today. Don't forget the points today.